Good to see everybody tonight. Are you in a good mood? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you will leave by the time you leave, I, I guarantee. Let's, uh, let's turn tonight to Job. Wait a minute, Jim. You said we're going to be in a good mood, and you're turning to Job. Job chapter 19. Job 19. And I have been tickled to be able to bring this tonight. I'm, I'm uh, fighting at the bit to spill my guts to you tonight. <laughs> and to bring God's word out. Job chapter 19. That's Old Testament for folks who are new. I, I want to bring you through an introduction of the first 18 chapters. I'm not going to read it all. I'll read a little bit. But uh, if you'll just listen. In Job 1.1, 1, 1, uh, the, the book says this. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. When the Bible tells us that Job, uh, who lived in the land of Uz, was blameless and upright, it does not mean that Job was perfect. It does not mean that Job was sinless. It means that Job intended his life to be following the Lord God. That's, he, he walks with God. Uh, he, he is like the rest of us. He is imperfect, but his heart, his life is set upon the Lord. And then in verse 7 of chapter 1, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Satan's looking for trouble. He is just wandering the earth looking for trouble, looking how he can uh, cause God pain, looking how he can stir things up. He's an instigator. He is a liar. He is a deceiver. He is a thief. And he's a destroyer. So he says, I've been just walking back and forth on the earth. And God says this, And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Now I don't know about you, but I hope the words never come out of the Lord's mouth. Have you considered my servant Jim? I don't want that. But that's what he said about Job. Have you considered my servant Job? That there's none like him on the earth. Listen, even God says he's a blameless and upright man. One who fears God and shuns evil. Have you considered Job? Satan says, well, I'll tell you what. Of course, Job worships you. Of course, Job follows you. Of course, Job praises you. You bless him and protect him. I can't get to him. God says, you know what? I'll let you, I'll let you get to him. I'm going to raise the hedge. I'm going to take away the hedge of protection. And you can do anything, but you cannot touch Job. Well, one of the amazing things, and a whole other sermon, is uh, the fact that if you read the scripture, it talks about one servant arriving at Job's presence, in Job's presence, one after the other. And as one's explaining how Job's life has been destroyed, uh, his, his animals have been stolen, uh, his servants have been killed, uh, these have been, this has happened and that has happened, and finally, even his children have been killed. That whole thing, because, and, and I'm, I'm timing it, reading it slowly, because it says, and while he was still speaking, the next servant came. And while he was saying this, the next servant came. I, I timed it at 41 seconds. In 41 seconds, let's round it up to a minute. In one minute, Job learns he has lost it all. He has lost it all. His family's gone, his riches are gone, and Job gets all that news just in a punch in the gut. And, uh, but I want you to also realize one thing, that in that moment, uh, Job says, well, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in that, Job did not sin. He still gave glory to the Lord. Now, did it hurt? Oh, yeah. It hurt big. Well, there was another meeting in heaven. And, uh, and we read that uh, Satan appears before God again. And uh, God says, have you considered my servant Job? I think he's, God's kind of rubbing it in. Hey, that didn't work, did it? My servant Job did not turn against me. He did not curse me. You're wrong, Satan. Satan says, well, sure, yeah. You didn't let me touch him. If I could touch him, if I could bring him personal bodily pain, he will turn on you and he will curse you, God. God says, you know what? You can touch him, but you can't kill him. Now, that's a, that's a pretty good check to write to Satan. You can touch him, but you can't kill him. And Job brought, or Satan brought Job to the point of death. I believe he was brought as close to death as Satan could do without killing him. Job ended up with, with pain and suffering. He ended up with boils, it says, from the crown of his head to the soles of his feet. And he was so miserable, he sat in the ash heap with broken pieces of pottery, scraping his skin. The Bible talks about worms in the sores. He is a miserable, miserable mess. Well, Jim, so far I'm not praising God too much. It's not that happy. Well, let's understand, too, that, uh, that God had Satan on a leash, didn't he? Satan was only allowed to go as far as God would let him. No further. No further. And what you and I need to understand is that when we have pain and suffering, uh, sometimes we might think, how can this be happening to me? I, I'm a good person. I'm, Lord, I'm following you. Did, did you hear my prayers this morning? Did you hear me praising you? Did you know I come to Sunday night service? Now that's special. And I sing the songs and, and uh, I worship with brothers and sisters in Christ. And yet I've still got this problem. And uh, we need to understand that God allows things in our lives. You, you may say, uh, how can you let this happen to me? I promise you it's past God's desk. And God said that was okay for you. God could stop it. And I'll bet when we get to heaven, we're going to find out that God had, had turned things around so many times so that we didn't experience pain. But there are times where we're tested to see what we're made of. Times, and, I, and I'm not saying so that God can see what we're made of. I'm saying so that you and I can see what we're made of. Is our faith real? Is our faith real? And in this case, with Job, God is teaching Satan a lesson. And we're going to find out that Job learns a lesson as well. In fact, in Romans 8, 28, when we talk about problems in our lives, Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, those who are called according to to his purpose. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So even that cancer, even that car accident, even that fight you had with your boss, even that fight you had with your wife, heaven forbid, all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. We don't understand that at least I don't. Maybe you all do. You can school me later. But uh, God makes all things work for his people. So in the first couple chapters of Job, we learn that Job's life has been destroyed. He has lost it all and even now his health. And he is a miserable human being. And at the end of chapter 2, three friends come to visit Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. It's kind of
Kind of sounds like Klingons from Star Trek. <laughs> Job chapter 3, Job moans and cries out in his anguish, wishing he had never been born. In Job chapter 4, Eliphaz replies and tells Job that the reason he's hurting is because he's a sinner. He's getting paid back for what he's done. Do we do that? You know, there's a saying, what goes around, what comes around. Uh, there's a saying uh, in the Bible, uh, what you sow, you're going to reap. And those things are probably true enough. We know for sure that what you sow, you're going to reap. But that's not the only reason that trouble happens. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they're trying to convince Job that that is the reason that what goes around comes around. That because what you sowed was sin, you're reaping now the whirlwind. You're reaping the payment for sin. In chapters 5 through 17, the debate goes on between the three friends and between Job back and forth and back and forth. And they all get a couple turns at it. And in Job chapter 18, Job continues his response to his friends and specifically Bildad. And in, uh, in Job 19, that's what we're going to look at is Job continues his defense to his friends. And we're going to begin in verse 19. Let's all get there. Just follow along with me. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Job, these are his words. All my close friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. Well, we know his wife was not very supportive, was she? She says, curse God and die. We hear in another place, Job says, she even thinks my breath stinks. Oh, that's TMI, Job. But uh, she's not supportive. All my close friends abhor me. Not only does Job feel that he has no heavenly comfort, because what Job is doing, he's blaming God. He's saying, God has done this to me. Listen, friends, uh, he says, what's happening to me is not because of a specific sin that I committed. I did not commit a sin that brought this on. God has decided for some reason to touch me with pain. God has decided to shoot his arrows at me. And it's God's arrows in my flesh that I feel. Job says, I've got no heavenly comfort. And now I have no earthly comfort. Because the friends that should be a comfort to me are not being those friends. He feels like heaven and earth have cast him into the trash heap. And his friends are rubbing salt in his wounds with every time they step up to the plate to accuse him of sin. And basically they're saying, repent, repent. Job is saying, I've got nothing to repent for. Now there's some pride in Job, isn't there? There is some pride in Job, but that's not what brought this on. And Job is going to ask for forgiveness. And Job is going to tell the Lord he was wrong about this a little later in the book. But right now, his friends are rubbing salt in his wounds. Let's look at verse 20. Job says, My bone clings to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. I love when we hear the world using Bible phrases, right? Uh, by the skin of my teeth is still a phrase that's used by the world. He escaped by the skin of his teeth. That's a Bible thing. And uh, the world may not realize just how many times they quote the Bible. Um, Job says, I'm wasting away. I'm suffering in anguish. Not just physical anguish, but my spirit is in anguish. I am suffering so badly because... My dear friends who came and sat with me seven days quietly and just commiserated with me are now accusing me of wrong and saying that's why I'm in this problem. They don't understand. That's probably the worst part. 
They don't understand, and nor do they show compassion for Job. But worse than that, he feels like this friend that he's had in heaven all these years, this God who, who he loves, is now his enemy. And it wasn't Job's choice. God, for some reason, has chosen to be Job's enemy. Job is crying out chapter after chapter. I want my day with the Lord. I want my moment that I can stand before him and I can ask him and he'll answer me. That's all I want is an answer. I want to know why, Lord, why it's driving him nuts. Verse 21. Have pity on me, he tells his friends. Have pity on me. Have pity on me. Oh, you, my friends. For the hand of God has struck me. I think the ESV and maybe some other versions say the finger of the Lord has touched me or the hand of the Lord has touched me. And, and the, the New King James, and I believe the King James says he struck me. God struck me. It's God that's beating me. It's God that's punishing me. I don't know what's going on. Have pity on me, he says twice. Your version may say, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. He's crying out, I believe tears are flowing down his face. Have pity on me! That's what I need from my friends. This is a good lesson for us. When your brother or sister in Christ is in turmoil, when they're in a trial, uh, when, when they're hurting, it is not the time to point a finger. It is the time to embrace them as a brother or a sister in Christ. You'll have time to talk about other things, and maybe you're even right. But what difference is it if you're right and there's no love in it? There's no compassion in it. He says, my suffering is because God has struck me. And this is not normal suffering. This is deep physical, mental, and emotional suffering that Job is going through. And Job believes it comes from God, the God he loves. Jesus was asked, teach us to pray. And Jesus began that prayer with two words, our Father. When you think about that, I believe that's how Job felt about God. God is his father. And when a father hurts a son, and the son doesn't know why, it hurts more than the stripes that are left on the body. It hurts the soul. It hurts the spirit. And Job doesn't know what to do with that. Can you see the tears rolling down his face as he cries out, Have mercy! Have pity on me. Guys, please be the friends you need to be right now. Please change this, this uh, matter of you accusing me, putting me on trial. I need help. I need pity. I need your embrace. Verse 22. Why do you persecute me as God does? That says a lot. God is persecuting Job in his mind. And are not satisfied with my flesh. Hey guys, uh, God is doing a great job of torturing me without you doing it too. That's what he's saying. Why can't you just be satisfied with me being me? Your friend. All right, your friend. And then in the midst of Job's suffering and defending himself to his friends... We come to the good part. Something clicks in Job. He has been defending himself now through all these chapters. There's a whole lot of chapters yet to go. But as we go from verse 22 to 23, something happens in Job's heart. And he feels the necessity to share something with his friends. Verse 23, Job says... Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. I think that is marvelous. We've got Job's words right here in front of us because that happened. 
Job says, this needs to be written down. My story needs to be shared. Somebody better write this down for the ages, for generations and generations to come. This story needs to be told. We're going to find out why. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book, verse 24, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. God's word is a forever thing. He speaks and it stands. The word of God stands. It cannot be moved. It cannot be changed. It is God's word. And Job, by the way, I believe Job is probably the author of his own book. Don't know that for sure. Some people say it might be that fourth friend toward the end of the book, Elihu. Uh, it might be him. Some say it could be Eliphaz, Bildad, or Zophar, one of those three. Some say it was someone else close to Job. I believe that it was Job himself that wrote it. He had, uh, when, when things were made better for him in the Lord, when he was rewarded beyond where he was before all this happened. I think he had years in his life. He says, you know what? I said that this ought to be written. I'm going to write it because I want people to know this. Job, what do you want people to know? And that's verse 25. And again, you, you have an emotional man here in front of you. And I apologize if my tears roll down my face because this is marvelous. Job says, this needs to be written, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. Listen up, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. I'm crying out to God in pain, but I'm still filled with hope. And I'm filled with the gospel. Uh, Jim, that's a New Testament thing. Well, what does the gospel mean? I heard it whispered. Somebody shouted. Good news. Good news. Good news. The gospel means good news. Here's the good news. Job knows his Redeemer lives. And he says he shall stand at last on the earth. There's a lantern of hope in the heart of Job, regardless of what he's going through. Like I said earlier, he said at one point, though he slay me, still will I trust him. Can you say that? If God decides to slay you for his purpose, will you still trust him? That's what Job said. And here he says, I know, listen, I know that my Redeemer lives. First of all, he knows he needs a Redeemer. He knows he's not perfect. The friends may think, Job, you think you're perfect. You think you don't sin. No, he doesn't. Job knows he needs a Redeemer. And yes, Generations to come need to read about this, need to read his testimony. And he says, and they need to read how I have not lost my faith in God. I have not lost my faith in God. If indeed this story is written, he says, don't forget to write this. Don't forget to write this. I know that my Redeemer lives. Let me ask you this. How did he know that? How did he know it? Well, if you know anything about the Bible itself, and probably you all do, I think I'm probably newer at being a Christian than you guys. But uh, Job is what we understand to be the very first book that was written. That's not the first account of what happened the earliest. That would be Moses. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That, that happened before Job was ever alive. 
but it was written after Job was alive. Here we see a book that was written before any other book. And somehow, without a book, without the words of Moses, without that testimony of in the beginning, God, Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know I need a Redeemer. I know he exists. And I know that my Redeemer lives. Right here, I think this makes Job probably a prophet. There may have been times when God actually spoke to Job in the past. That's not unusual. In the Old Testament, there were men of God whom God spoke to, right? And we're not told specifically until just a little bit later. Because God speaks directly to Job, doesn't he, in this book? And maybe that's why Job was so insistent that God answer him. That God answered him. Come on, Lord, speak to me. Tell me what's going on. Because in the past, God had talked with him. The speculation. The word redeemer. It is uh, the Hebrew word ga'al. Ga'al. It means deliverer. It means redeemer. It means avenger. It means one who would stand for another to defend his cause. It means to act as a kinsman redeemer, as we read in the book of Ruth. <coughs> it, it is a member of a family, a close member in the family, as Boaz was in that book of Ruth. And God is mankind's close family. God is mankind's close family. Again, Jesus taught us to say, our Father. In Genesis 1, you don't have to turn there. In Genesis 1, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Let us make man in our image. Now, I didn't say it quite that way when Marcia and I first got married. I didn't say, Marsha, I think it's time. Let's make a little one in our image. But it meant that. <laughs> in fact, we made three little ones in our image. How about you guys? I guess what I'm trying to say is God is a father. God is a father. And when we need him to step in and stand up for us, he's the kinsman redeemer. He is the one who steps in and fills the gap. Yes, we are God's creation, made in his likeness. And when we love and follow him, even today in Christ, we are his children. Scripture says that. We are his sons and daughters in Christ. That puts us on a playing field of being called what Jesus is called. Jesus is God in the flesh. But he's called the Son of God. And you and I, if we're in the Lord, we are sons and daughters in Christ to God. It's a very special thing. I don't know if you understand how special that is and how special you are to the Lord. And listen, if there's folks listening tonight, either here or on the Internet, you are that special. And God wants you in his family. We'll talk about how that can happen. So Jesus Christ is our hero. He is our redeemer. He is much more than a redeemer. Job says that he is my redeemer. Can you say that? Maybe you know that Jesus is the redeemer. Jesus is our savior. But is he your savior? Is he your Lord? Is he your God? At one point in the gospels, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do anything I say? He can't be your Lord if you don't obey him. But listen, as amazing as that statement is, for I know that my Redeemer lives, as if that's not enough, Job continues in verse 25. Did you see it? And he shall stand at last on the earth. 
How on earth does Job know that again? How does he know that? How does he know that Jesus Christ is coming? This is written at least 2,000 years before Christ. And again, there is no book. Now, listen, the, the fathers of the clans would pass information about God on from generation to generation to generation. And daddies and grandpas and great-grandpas, it is our job to make sure that our families are aware of all of that that's happened before. That we can share with them God created the heavens and the earth. That we can share with them that there is one who loves you, who gave his life so that you can live, so that your sins are forgiven, and he wants you in his family. We need to pass that on. And, and opening a book is fine, but can you share that with them out of your own heart and out of your own life? Can you do that? And he shall stand at last on the earth. He says he shall stand. He's a person. The Redeemer is a person. It's not a wispy spirit or Casper the ghost. The Redeemer is Jesus Christ. He doesn't know his name yet, but he says it's my Redeemer. He will stand physically upon the earth. Job chapter 9. I am going to ask you to turn there. Hang on to the 19. We're coming back to it. But turn to Job chapter 9. <clears throat> Job cried out for this Redeemer. Job cried out for this Mediator. In Job chapter 9, let's look at verse 32. Talking about his day of sharing with God is impossible for him. Why? Verse 32, for he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him. He's talking about God, who we would call the Father today. For he's not a man as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. Verse 33, nor is there any mediator between us. Your version may say arbiter or something like that. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. <coughs> you know that he's describing the Lord Jesus here? He says, oh, that there was a mediator. Oh, that, so it, it shows us that he doesn't fully understand Jesus Christ yet, but he has a sense, he knows there's a redeemer, and he says, right now, there's no mediator who can put his hand on my head and who can hold God's hand and fill the gap for me, can be my redeemer, can be the one who can, who can speak to God because God's not listening to me, who can be the one to be the conduit for my prayers to the, to the Father. He says there's no one like that. You and I live in a time that is wonderful. We have that mediator. And he is Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The rest that he's talking about is not because you're, you're carrying asphalt shingles up to a roof. The rest is laying down your burden of sin, putting it down, never having to pick it up again, giving it to Jesus because he paid for it. He paid for it, and he wants you to be forgiven. And so... He knew that one day his Redeemer would physically stand on the earth. And indeed, a couple of thousand years later, Jesus Christ came. Now today, we have doubters just like in Job's time. When Job says things like this, I'm sure there were doubters back then that said, well, where is he? You say he's coming. Where is he? Today there are people like that, and they say, well, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus uh, lived on this earth, and he died. He says he's coming back. In fact, the Bible says he's coming back quickly. 
Actually, if you look at the translation, it means he's coming back suddenly, surprisingly. And, and those who are not living in Christ are going to be shocked when he comes. He's coming suddenly. Look at verse 26 in chapter 19. I'll give you a moment to turn back to chapter 19. <clears throat> Chapter 19, verse 26, he says, And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. It is amazing what Job knows. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about bodily resurrection. He knows that there's a bodily resurrection coming. He says, in my skin, when my skin is destroyed, what? going to be burned up in a fire. He's talking about when I rot in the grave. After I rot in the grave, in my flesh, I'm going to see God. Well, wait a minute. Your skin rotted in the grave. He has that sense. He has that knowledge. Somehow, some way. Now, he doesn't know mechanically how that's going to happen. Do you want to know how resurrection is going to happen? I can't tell you. Because I don't know. That is a God thing. we got to let God be God there. And, and when he says it's going to happen, all you have to do, this is the easy part, is believe it. That's all you have to do. And Job says, in my flesh, I'm going to see God. And what he's talking about, folks, is Jesus. I'm going to see Jesus. He doesn't know his name. How will I see God? In my own flesh. Verse 27. Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. We'll stop there for a moment. He says, these eyes will see my Lord. These eyes will see the Redeemer. He will come, he will stand on the earth, after my flesh has rotted in the grave. I will see him with these eyes. Well, your eyes are going to be rotted out of your head, Job. Sorry for anyone who hasn't had their dinner yet. He says, with these eyes, there's a bodily resurrection. And then he says, how my heart yearns within me. Now, the argument goes on after this. Between Job and his friends. But as he leaves this thought, he says, Guys, when I tell you what I know about God, when I tell you that I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand on the earth one day, he will physically be on the earth one day, and I know that after my skin has rotted, after I've died and gone to the grave, that I'll see him with these eyes. <laughs> <clears throat> he says, how my heart yearns within me. Job's spirit jumps to a higher ground right there. He needs that. The, the world calls it going to your happy place. <laughs> going to your happy place. Job goes to his happy place for a moment. He needed that. He needed a break. He needed a breather. But if he's like me, he didn't say it. In soft terms, he shouted it because this is good news. This is the gospel. There's one who cares about you and about me and who cared about Job. And Job says, regardless of why God is doing this, and I just want to know why, regardless of that, I know that there's a Redeemer who cares for me, and I'm going to see him. I'll have my day in front of the Redeemer. And he says, my heart skips for joy at the thought. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross. And I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, my soul. 
It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Think about it. Think about it. If we were watching a television news broadcast right now, and the broadcaster was live with Job, and Job is saying these things, Job is on one side of the split screen, and the screen is split, and you know how they'll have a reporter and then somebody that they're talking to over on this other part of the screen. So on the other part of the screen, the screen is Satan. And I just see Job. He is arguing with his friends. He's saying, you dirty dogs. You are not treating me right. You're not treating me with, with compassion. You're not treating me with love. Where is your love, guys? And then all of a sudden, he breaks out with this. This needs to be written. And Satan perks up because he's figuring Job is going to say, God is a dirty dog. That's not what he says. For I know that my Redeemer lived and he cares about me and I'm going to see him and I see Satan on the other side of the screen with his mouth open and his jaw dropped because he loses. He's lost the battle. The battle goes on between Job and his friends but at that moment Satan has got to know that his plan did not work on Job and God won. Job stayed faithful to the Lord God. It's a great lesson for us, guys. A great lesson for us. You may be in a battle for your life. You may be in such trouble and such pain. But don't you dare turn your back on God. Yes, you can question Him. Do it reverently. Do it respectfully. You can question the Lord God. There's nothing wrong with that. Amen. You can ask Him the tough questions. He's the guy that's got the tough answers. But do it with respect. Do it with love. God doesn't mind that. But don't say, I blame you, God, and because of that, I'm doubling my fist up at you. That's the wrong thing. That's the wrong thing. As Howard Cosell would have said years ago, down goes Satan. Down goes Satan. He's down for the count here. And he's lost another battle. Tonight, I also know that my Redeemer lives. Do you? Do you know that actually Jesus Christ lives? We sing the song, He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. The world says, how do you know? You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. And the world says, so what? He lives within your heart? That's not evidence. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. Jesus Christ is real. And he lives today. And he lives to make intercession for you and me. He's at the right hand of God right now, pleading our case. And one day, with these eyes, I will see him. For those who have not had faith that that's the truth, for those who have not uh, repented of their sins, and listen, we're all sinners. I don't care if you say, well, I've been good for 20 years. Number one, I doubt it. Number two, Okay, so you were bad 20 years ago. You need to repent. You need to turn from a life without Christ, a life of sin. You need to turn from that and say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I don't want that life anymore that's absent of you. I don't want a life of sin. I don't want the world to be my leader. I want you to be my leader. And I want to follow you and I want to obey you. Well, okay, you want to obey me? Jesus says that... Uh, that they're to go and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins, for the remission of your sins, and you will receive the gift 
of the Holy Spirit. It's that simple. It starts with you here or you online making that decision and coming forward into the presence of God and saying, I will obey. I want to be buried in baptism, identifying myself with Jesus Christ. When he was buried in that grave, I'll be buried too. I want to bury this old man full of sin, this old woman full of sin. I want to bury this teenager full of sin. And I want to rise without the sin to walk in newness of life in Christ. I want that. I want it. You shouldn't be ashamed. You shouldn't be afraid. Because you will belong to the Lord after that. God gives everything to his kids. In this life, not always. When I was five years old and asked my dad for the car keys, he was pretty smart not to give them to me. But in heaven, in eternity, we're promised that we don't know the half of how wonderful it's going to be to be in the presence of the Lord forever. On last found this ocean when body billows roll. I fix my hope in Jesus, blessed anchor of my soul. When trials fierce assail me, I storm the gathering door. I rest upon his mercy and trust him more. I'm anchored in Jesus, the storms of life I'll pray. I'm anchored in Jesus, I fear no wind no wave. I'm anchored in Jesus, for he has power to save. I'm anchored to the rock of Blessing peace, his voice is still the waters, and in their trouble cease. Oh, my pilot and deliverer, to him I all can find. For always when I need him, he's at my side. When I'm anchored in Jesus, the storms of life I'll break. I'm anchored in Jesus, I fear no wind or wave. I'm anchored in Jesus, for he has power to save. Hallelujah.